This breaking news an hour before I came on air that Benjamin Netanyahu has categorically dismissed Hamas's new calls for a prolonged ceasefire in Gaza, pledging to forge ahead with Israel's military campaign until securing what he terms as total victory. Netanyahu pledged to destroy Hamas and ruled out any arrangement that leaves a Palestinian militant group in full or partial control of Gaza. I would like to emphasize once again, there is no other solution other than this complete and decisive victory, because otherwise it is just a matter of time till the next massacre, and the axis of terror from Iran will continue. So only by destroying Hamas will we have security for the state of Israel in the north and in the south, because Hamas would like to radiate its terror all over the Middle East. Well, joining me to discuss this is the Israeli-American journalist, Emily Schrader, the Israeli-American activist and author, Miko Peled, and the Palestinian commentator, Omar Bader. Well, welcome to all of you. Um, start with you, Emily. Uh, a lot of people around the world imploring Israel to have some kind of ceasefire, not least to get the hostages out, but also to stop the relentless killing of uh, innocent Palestinians, women, children, and so on. But Netanyahu absolutely adamant uh, tonight. No deal, no ceasefire. We will go on until Hamas are completely finished. Uh, what is your reaction to this? Well, first of all, thanks for having me on this important topic tonight. I think the way that even the sentiment was phrased that it's Israel rejecting ceasefire isn't quite accurate you know, when it comes to what the situation is on the ground, Israel has been willing to accept multiple ceasefires in the past, as well as they have done temporary pauses in fighting. Um, the reality is that we had a ceasefire on October 6th. It wasn't Israel who started this war, uh, but it is Israel who will finish it. And you cannot invade the sovereign borders. We're not even talking about disputed territory. We're not talking about the West Bank, but the sovereign borders of the state of Israel rape, murder, and maim innocent people, and then kidnap over 200 more and expect that you can dictate the terms of your own survival and staying in power in the Gaza Strip. This is just not the way it works, and Israel would actually be in violation of international law for doing so. Because Israel, as a state actor, has an obligation legally to restore a sense of security to the citizens of the state of Israel. And unfortunately, that cannot be done until Hamas is removed from power in the Gaza Strip. Well, Mika, I can see you laughing there incredulously. Before you respond to that, I just want to inform viewers about what the Hamas proposed deal was, as seen by the Reuters news agency. Phase one, a 45-day pause in fighting, during which all Israeli women hostages, males under 19, the elderly and sick, would be exchanged for Palestinian women and children held in Israeli jails. Israeli forces would withdraw from populated areas of Gaza and the reconstruction of hospitals and refugee camps would begin. Phase two, remaining male Israeli hostages would be exchanged for Palestinian prisoners and Israeli forces would leave Gaza completely. Phase three, both sides would exchange remains and bodies. And Hamas is also for calling for the complete withdrawal of Israeli forces from Gaza going forward. Um, your response to Netanyahu saying no deal? Oh, Mika. Mika, I'm sorry. I think you're muting. You're on mute at the moment, if you wouldn't mind just unmuting oh, yourself. Sorry there we go. About that, yes. You're back. Well, it, seem, it seems certainly that the Hamas proposal is reasonable, and Netanyahu, being a genocidal maniac who wants to continue the killing and the bloodshed, is not interested. I mean, I think we've seen that the last uh, several months of, of, of his policies in Gaza have led to what, what can only be described as mass genocide. And since the entire world is standing with him and he's not seeing any, he's not facing any consequences seriously, there's no reason for him to stop. And so the question is, will the international community step in and force him to stop the killing, force him to accept the Hamas uh, or the, the, the Palestinian proposals uh, and will the international community stand by the Palestinians uh, who are now, like I said, presented uh, the world and presented Israel with a very reasonable, um, a very reasonable proposal for ceasefire? Having said that, I think the ceasefire is nowhere nearly enough. I think uh, I, I think the entire international community needs to come in and and declare a no-fly zone over Gaza and and impose severe sanctions against the state of Israel, particularly now since it's obvious that he is the, is the state of Israel is refusing even a very reasonable proposal 
by uh, by the Palestinians, by the Palestinian representatives in, in the Gaza Strip. So it seems very, very clear. The only question is, why is the international community not standing with the Palestinians and not helping the Palestinians to enforce at least this very reasonable um, okay, but uh, isn't the, proposal? It, OK, but to play devil's advocate here, uh, Israel's position is that Hamas committed an appalling terror attack on October the 7th, killing over 1,200 people, uh, many of whom were innocent women and children, butchered in the most savage manner. And they have publicly stated since then, Hamas, that they will do the same thing again and again and again if they're able to. And at the moment, depending on which figures you, you look at, at least half the Hamas fighting force is still there and still fighting. Um, representing to Israelis an existential threat to their very existence. So why should Netanyahu, in that circumstance, allow half of Hamas to continue to exist and present that threat to his people? Well, the question is why, why we're accepting the, the Israeli premise to this. Israel has been engaged in genocide and apartheid policies for 75 years. Palestinians have been living under a reign of terror, particularly in the Gaza Strip. This is not the first time that Israel massacres civilians by the thousands in the Gaza Strip. So why Palestinians are resisting and why Palestinian fighters came out of Gaza on October 7th and, and, and engaged in resistance is not the question. Well, it's not resistance, is it? I mean, are, was, was, what is, what is resistant about it raping and murdering resistant. and kidnapping innocent civilians? It is civilians. absolute resistance. How is that resistant? Hypocrisy. Murdering the hypocrisy. children. Murdering the hypocrisy. children on the, on the streets Israel of Israel. Israel has no right to talk about killing children. You? Israel so, has no right Israel to talk about right murdering to exist children. In the first place? Israel, Do you Israel believe has that Israel children. has a right to exist in the Israel first place? Israel has been massacring children. Do you believe okay. that Israel me, okay. has a right to exist? Let me, hang on, Israel hang on, let me, please, no please. Right to talk about the killing let me children. interrupt. Uh, you because know what it, to let me interrupt because let me interrupt because we the third. Let me please, with respect, Mr. Pellet, let me interrupt to say. One member of the panel hasn't spoken yet and has kept very quiet, respectfully, during that uh, exchange between the two of you. Omar Bada, I mean, this, this cuts to the quick of the story, really. If you view what Hamas did on October the 7th as simply resistance, then, to me, you are ignoring the reality that it was an appalling terror attack. You can have absolutely legitimate concerns about the scale of Israel's response. I have them myself. But do you genuinely also believe that it was resistance what happened that day? I'll, I'll get to that in a minute, but I do have to respond first to the gall of somebody invoking the killing of children in light of Israel having killed nearly 12,000 Pal Palestinian children buried under the rubble over the past three months in a genocidal scale in violence against, against defenseless children. It's, it's utterly and completely absurd. And the second and equally important point to make is that anybody who tells you that there was a ceasefire on October 6th was lying to you. On October 6th, Palestinians had no freedom whatsoever throughout the Gaza Strip. They could not go in and out of Gaza, no airport, no seaport, no jobs, no access to the outside world, no functioning electricity. And Israel continued to steal Palestinian land in the West Bank throughout that entire year and for decades, frankly, even before that, and had killed nearly 250 Palestinians in the course of just the beginning of the year until October 6th. So people who call that a ceasefire are basically telling you to accept a status quo in which Palestinians can be murdered, they can have their children thrown in military detention indefinitely, in which Palestinian land can be taken away from them at will and they can be denied freedom. And that's an acceptable status quo so long as Israelis are safe. There's a word for that kind of world and that's called apartheid. That is the current status quo that always existed leading up to the violence that we saw on October 7th. Now, certainly, any time that you engage in violence against civilians, that is completely indefensible, and there's no way to excuse that. Nonetheless, thinking people look at the situation that led up to it and understand that imprisoning Palestinians by the millions for no crime other than being Palestinian in Gaza and, allowing, and denying them access to the outside world uh, is essentially a recipe to create a wave of violence that is effectively inevitable. People who are serious about wanting to end violence and serious about producing a situation in which there is peace for both Israelis and Palestinians have to be concerned about the driving force of that violence. And the driving force is absolutely Israeli apartheid that has denied Palestinians freedom for too long. And until you solve that underlying problem, you're never going to get into a situation in which okay. there is any 
safety or security for anyone. You know, okay. you, continue, you continue using all these buzzwords, apartheid, genocide, and those aren't what those words actually mean, but I do want to clarify a few things that you commented on. It's not, it's and the nice first of you to dispute them, them, but Amnesty speaking, International and Human Rights Watch be, and the UN disagree I shouldn't with be you. speaking about killing children. There is a massive difference between a defensive war targeting terrorist targets that are using civilian sites, including UN schools, including hospitals, endangering their own people in the Gaza Strip, something that they themselves have admitted and no, the that's a lie. invading I mean, of the sovereign right now, borders of a foreign country that. and murdering children no, in their no, home on Emily, a All right, let me ask Emily a question. No Emily, let, not a defensive war. Let me ask Emily. Let me ask. Let me. Excuse me. It's in defense of apartheid. If you could stop shouting over each other, let me. Let me ask Emily a question, and it's this: Emily, look, I think Israel had a right to defend itself, a duty to defend itself, but we now have. As we've heard, I think it's 12,000 children believed to have been killed. Uh, another 20,000 or so have been orphaned. Uh, Two-thirds of Gaza has been flattened. And here Benjamin Netanyahu says after four months, well, we're nowhere near finished. There's months more of this. We will continue until the last Hamas terrorist is gone. OK, but that may mean the entire Gaza Strip is gone, destroyed, flattened. You know, it may mean, well, hang on. It may mean the number of children killed doubles to 20,000, maybe 30,000. At what point does this become, even to people who support Israel implacably about this, does it become just utterly disproportionate? Well, I think proportionality isn't the actual question here. There's a very easy way to end this war, and that is to return all of the hostages and to surrender unconditionally. That is what Hamas should be doing. That is where the but focus and the pressure of the But that wouldn't end the war, would it? But, uh, hang on. But, should... Emily, that of would not... Of course it would. That those would... Are no, Benjamin those are Netanyahu... Two no, hang on. Benjamin Netanyahu has stated yeah. unequivocally this goes on until Hamas are finished, all of them. That means exactly. another exactly. That means another twenty thousand people have to be killed, right? Who are just the terrorists. No. So he's not going to no, stop if, if the hostages got released tomorrow. But that's not true. I said ne the unconditional. Who, Emily, let me the finish. Unconditional let me finish my question. Of Hamas. I don't think Prime Minister Netanyahu has any intention, even if the hostages get returned tomorrow, of letting twenty thousand Hamas terrorists remain in power in Gaza. He's going to continue. But that's. I already said that. I said the release of hostages and the unconditional surrender of Hamas. Hamas cannot remain in power in the Gaza Strip and restore, have Israel restore a sense of security. Those two things cannot coexist. That is why Netanyahu said we will not accept any term in which Hamas stays in power, because they will do the same thing again. And the longer this goes on, the longer they stay in power, the more funding. I think the most recent documents said 150 million went through Sinwar in the documents that the IDF but Emily, found you can't the just kill the more money Emily, that Iran is funding, Emily, you cannot just the stronger kill, Hamas is. You, you cannot just kill everybody in Gaza. You can't. Israel is not intending to kill everyone in Gaza. If they carry, they on, for, call if they carry on for many regular, more months, we are risking, and they carry on for many more have, months, how many people are going to get killed? No. I can't this answer is, that question as to how joke. many people are going to be killed, but I can tell you that not a single, uh, not even one more person would be killed if Hamas surrendered unconditionally today. I'm, All right, I'm going to find out. Not one more person would be killed. Here's, okay. Can I suggest something? Yes. May, may, may I make a suggestion? Since Netanyahu and his government have, before October 7th, have already, and, and previous Israeli governments, have murdered more civilians than Hamas ever did, why don't we do, why don't we flip this uh, equation and say that the hostages will be released once Netanyahu and his government are taken to The Hague and, 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 uh, and charged with war crimes. I think it makes much more sense. The Israelis have killed far more Palestinian children and Palestinian civilians than Hamas or any Palestinians ever have. Israeli attacks on Gaza preceded Hamas by decades. What Israeli attacks October? in the West Bank go on. Israeli attacks in Jerusalem go on where, the, where Hamas is not in charge. Okay. So, I mean, this whole Hamas uh, excuse is ridiculous. Okay. I, I, why don't I'm... we do this? Okay. Let's, wait till, till, let's wait till we remove uh, Netanyahu's government and then negotiate. I think that should be the condition. And the Israeli military, which is a genocidal terrorist organization, is disarmed and dismantled. That yeah, will be the time. To... Okay, let, let, me, let, me the final, let me give the final word to the Palestinian on the panel, which is you, Omar. Look, we have to be stop this pretense that Israel is engaging in accidental violence in which Palestinian civilians are killed. Every major human rights organization in the world, including, by the way, Israeli human rights organizations, document that the Israeli military is engaging in indiscriminate violence against civilians. And that is why the International Court of Justice has found that there is actually a plausible case 
for Israel being engaged in genocidal violence in Gaza. And that should tell you something. And we have to stop pretending that you can kill this many people on accident. And just one issue with, with something that you mentioned, Piers, I don't think this is a question of proportionality. We have to be clear about what Israel is doing here. This is not an act of self-defense because an occupier can never, in principle, be defending themselves against the people they're occupying. If we are serious, once again, what Israel is doing in Gaza, if they wanted self-defense... There were zero, the there were zero Israelis way, in Gaza on October 6th. Zero. The, the, yeah, the inside, Gaza is not they occupied. Controlled Gaza, they bombed it at will whenever they wanted to, and they prevented the Palestinians the in Gaza from Israeli. going Funny in and out. you never mentioned so Egypt. No responsibility for Egypt. You know Everything is always Israel's fault. Emily, you know, no, 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 no. You know the I'm problem, sorry. The problem with that argument, still, the problem with that argument is this, is that when it wanted to, at the start of this war, Israel had the power and capability to turn off the energy into Gaza, to turn off the internet, to turn off the water, to turn off the food supply. That is a form of occupation, even if you're not physically inside point, Gaza. That's actually false. What that's Israel actually is false. Defending. Israel wasn't able to turn off all of the water. Yes, it is. That is that they is only control 30% Not all of it, but it was able to turn it off for a lot of people. I don't think Israel should have that power over any Palestinians. If Israel... If Israel was interested in self defense, I don't think that a terrorist defense, organization should be ruling Palestinians either. Palestinians. I don't think that. I agree with you on that. The is ruling Israel. What's I agree with you. I agree with you on that point, with Emily. Nuclear power is no. ruling Israel. Okay, listen. I've got to bring it. I've got to bring it to an end. It's a, it was a good. It was a good debate. Thank you. I've got to leave it there. I'm sorry. We've run out of time. We've gone longer than I, than I was expecting to. I appreciate the passion on all sides. I hope we can get to a point where this ends. And, and people stop dying. I think we can all agree with that. So thank you, all of you, yes. for joining me. I appreciate it.